Amen. If you're ready for the word this morning, somebody shout, oh yeah. God bless you. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to look at Philippians today, the third chapter, the 12th verse through the 13th verse. And I pray that this message would speak to somebody to touch their heart, to get in their heart. And I believe the Lord's got something good for us this morning. If you're excited, somebody say amen. amen. All right, let's look at the word of the Lord. It says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. That I may lay a hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching toward those things which are ahead. Forgetting those things that are behind me and I want to reach towards some new things. I want to talk to you on a thought this morning simply entitled, I'm not going back. Anybody got their mind made up this morning, I'm not going backwards. I'm not going where I was. I'm not going where I used to be. I'm going somewhere new. Somebody touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. I'm going somewhere different. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your anointing, God. Father, Lord, many of us in this building, we have pasts. We have past failures. We have past lives. We have past sins. But, Father, I pray today, Lord, you let a spirit, God, reign in this place. That, Lord God, that we stop going back, God, and start putting our mind on new things to go where we've never been, to do new things in you, Father. And we love you, and we praise you, and we'll give you the glory and honor. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Many of you know I love history. I'm a history guy. And this story fits so perfectly. Actually, I preached a, a sermon about five years ago. But at this moment, most of you ain't heard the story, so I wanted to reuse this story. And I just thought it would be good to put it in the beginning. It's on February 19th, 1519. The Spanish explorer Hernan Cortez set sail for Mexico. He had 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 soldiers. The indignant, indignant population upon his arrival that he was going to try to conquer was 5 million. So from a purely mathematical standpoint the odds were stacked against him 7,541 to 1. Now keep in mind the previous two expeditions to establish an, uh, uh, a colony in the new world if you will was anything but a success. It had, both of them had failed miserably. Yet facing insurmountable odds and facing an established pattern of defeat Cortez would conquer most of the South American content. Despite the odds, he went where he'd never been. Despite the odds, he did what others said was impossible. Do you know how he found success? Do you know what kept soldiers believing instead of retreating? The answer could be found in his first command when landing in the New World. Do you know what his first command was when he landed on the New World? We're here, now turn around and burn those ships. Get rid of them, because we're not going back. I, I want to get it in our minds that we're here now. We're outnumbered, but we've made up our minds. We're fighting. In order to find victory, sometimes you've got to remove the notion of retreat. And I think that's what happens so much in American Christian families. We've learned to retreat. I'm just telling you, how many pastors, how many churches, how many congregations have been faced with point-blank questions? Do you believe in this? Are you saying that? Do you believe in that? Are you doing this? And how many of them have retreated? Because they find it easier to retreat and not stand for the truth, to stand up and say, yes, that's a sin. Yes, they're going to hell. Yes, you can't do that. No, that ain't right. We live in a day and age where we've left some ships and many people have find the notion to retreat. But I think if we want to see something new in our lives, we've got to make up our mind, I'm not going back. If I want to get something new, I'm going to realize I'm going to be hit by the enemy. 
I'm going to be hit in the face sometimes. I've got to make up my mind. I'm not going backwards. I'm not going where I was. I'm not doing what I used to do. I'm not believing what I used to believe. I'm not saying what I used to say. I've got my mind made up. I'm planted in the new world. The odds might not be for me, but honey, I'm not going where I just came from. That's the thing. There's a lesson to be learned when we're faced with an illness when we're trying to find a better job, when we're trying to lose weight, when we're allowing our faith to suffer because of unanswered prayers, we've got to plant our feet on the ground and make up our mind we're not going back. I am staying here. I am here for the duration. I'm here even though things are getting worse. I'm going to believe even though the doctors are telling me I'm crazy. I'm going to stand here. I am not going back to where I've been because if I go back to where I've been, I will always always be what I am right now. But let this preacher encourage you this morning and remind you, Jesus said, you will do even greater things than I did. This church is meant for greatness, and we will not attain greatness if our enemy already knows what our backside looks like. He knows what our back looks like because he's always seen it retreat but i'm telling you he needs to know exactly what our face looks like because we planted our feet and says no i'm standing and i'm fighting for this marriage i'm standing and i'm fighting for my faith i'm standing and i'm fighting for my ministry i'm standing and i'm fighting for what everything i hold dear i refuse to turn around and run when my god has called me when i've done all that i can do to stand and see his salvation come on and bless the lord in this house We should have the same fighting spirit as Cortez. That's why I love what Philippians said, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. But this is what I do. I forget what's behind me, and I strain on ahead. I love this. I press towards the goal. See, I I know you can't see it now because me and cardio don't like we belong in the same breath. But I used that was my mom laughing, by the way. I just heard that. She's going to hell for laughing at her pastor. Amen. But I used to play basketball in high school. Matter of fact, I played with Mark Jett right there. Mortimer Jordan legend right there. Wait, everybody, Mark, there you go. Right there. I just made his year. He will be out back signing autographs if you'd like to. But we played basketball together. And there was one thing we would do, Mark, you would remember, there would be a time when you would play defense and you would allow the basketball carry to move it up the court. But then there was a time in which the coach would say, press. And when you pressed, You didn't even let them throw the ball in. You got up all in their face. You got up on your guy. Even the big centers were getting up half court making sure that they didn't push. There's a time to press. Paul said, I'm pressing towards something new. What I would tell the church is we played last days defense long enough. We've sat back and let the enemy pass the ball right on up. He's dribbled into our family. He's dribbled into our country. He's taken over our culture. He's done a lot of things. But I hear what Paul is saying. It is time for us to press. It's time for us to get up in the face of God's blessing, to get up in the face of God's goodness, to get up in the face of our enemy and press. To press. That's what we've got to do. Get up in the face of greatness. Is that not what blind Bartimaeus did? Hey, let me just stop right here. You know, I understand we're a charismatic church, and I make no apologies for that. I believe what the Bible says is do not quench the Spirit. But I want to remind you of how many miracles, including blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus said, hey, Jesus, over here. Hey, Jesus. You know what? The disciples said, shut up. The disciples told him to be quiet, but he was tired of blindness. He made up his mind, I'm not going another day. I'm not going backward. Greatness is before me. One other time will I get Jesus this close to me. They said, stop it. He said, but I'm not going back. But instead, the Bible said he cried out all the more. He acted like a foolish person. Now, if he's in a normal church, we'd say, well, bless God, that was out of order. But don't tell blind Bartimaeus that. Blind Bartimaeus said, hey, Jesus. He started going crazy because he was pressing. Honey, if some of you would run after the Spirit of God the same way you're running after a raise on your job, 
something. If Jesus wants me to worship, he'll come and he'll move and then I'll follow the leading of the Spirit. You don't do that when it comes to eating. You don't sit up in Chick-fil-A parking lot and say, well, if God intends me to eat, somebody go bring me a sandwich. We've got to press. There's going to come a time where we've got to worship more than we've worshiped before, where we've got to shout more than we've shouted before. We've got to say, Jesus, I'm not leaving until you bless me. Jesus, I've been in mediocrity long enough. I need some greatness. We've got to press. We've got to press. Isn't that a good thought? Get up in the face. She's my wife. I can do it to her. Get in the face of greatness. She was getting in the face of greatness. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We've got to learn to press. So let's look real quickly at three things. Three things I want you to look on. Three things people prefer that keeps them from moving forward, keeps them living in the past. Number one, people prefer commas. When thinking about a transition, I couldn't help but think of the story of Elijah. It's a great story. Elijah was a farmer. I need to remind some people in here, God doesn't call bishops. He calls farmers. He turns farmers into bishops. You've been sitting saying, I can't, when God says, you're exactly who I'm looking for. But here's Elijah never been anything. What does God say? He says, look, hey, I'm calling you. Do you know what Elijah does? He makes up his mind, I'm going to follow this calling. But he just doesn't get up and go. It's one of the coolest parts of Scripture. He has a farmer. So you know what he did? He broke up his plow and burned it. Then killed his oxen and had the biggest barbecue they'd had in years. Now, he didn't have to do that. That wasn't a prerequisite for joining. But see, God was calling him to a new chapter in his life. I need somebody to hear me. God wants to call us to a new chapter but the problem is, in order for God to bring us to a new chapter in our life, we have to put punctuation on the old one. Now, this is what I've learned, church. We got too many people can't live in the new chapter because they're still living in the old. See, we're putting punctuation on this chapter, but we're using commas. Let me tell you something about commas. Commas are a very interesting point of punctuation. They're very very important, but they can be dangerous. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I have them do this for me. Look at this, this same sentence. I'm hungry. Let's eat, Grandma. Let's move this comma. I'm hungry. Let's eat, Grandma. So please, save your grandmama's life. Put the comma in the right place. Commas. But what I have found out is that the church is a comma-believing people. God has put us in an old chapter saying, I'm going to bring you to a new one, but instead of putting a period here, we put a comma. Comma means it's a new thought, but the old thought's allowed to continue. There's a reason why we can't live in victory, and that's because we put commas on the end of our old life. We've been saved comma, I'm moving forward, comma, but I'm still looking at things I shouldn't have been looking at. We put commas. I used to drink, comma, but God is doing great things in my life, comma, but I still struggle from time to time, comma. It should be a period right there on the end. There's too many people living with, here's a good one. I was hurt 10 years ago, comma. You can't get away from the pain and the hurt and the baggage you're carrying because you're putting a comma and you're living with it. But I'm telling you what we should do. We shouldn't put a comma. God didn't call us to put a comma. We need to put exclamation points at the end. That's what Elijah was doing. Elijah was saying, my friends are saying I'm crazy. I've never been taught the Torah. God has never spoken to me audibly. I just messed up my row of plants last week. And yet God is calling me to do something new. 
and yet I'm going to burn this bad boy. I'm putting an X. I'm not putting a comma. I'm not putting a semicolon. I'm not putting a paraphrase. I'm not putting anything. I'm putting a period because I'm not going back to where I've been. I made up my mind. I'm staying here. Marriages, you need to put some explanation points on things that happened eight years ago. You don't need to be carrying the junk that's been going on. We've been, we had problems, comma. Nope, we had problems, exclamation point, but that junk's under the blood, and now all things have passed away, and all things have become new. We've got to get to the point where we have, see, this is what I need you to hear me, okay? Elijah made a statement of faith. You can write this down, I believe it's on your hand. Our statements of faith should make a statement to step out on faith sometimes. Don't just do it just because. Don't test God. But every once in a while, you just need to step out on faith to make a statement. My question is, what kind of statement is our faith making? Is it saying something? Is it telling us? What kind of statement is your faith making? So let's go to point number two. People prefer buying in. I love this statement, buying in. Anybody ever heard the time? You got to buy in. Anybody? Wave at me if you've ever heard it. Okay, good. Buying in. I love college football. I'm getting a little nervous because college football season, and I don't need all that stress on Saturday. You know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to get away from it, but college football can be stressful, but it is a great time. I love college football. And one thing I always hear is coaches want their players to buy in. Who may ever had a new manager and a new manager will say, hey, you got to buy in, buy in to the vision. And what I've discovered is Christian people love buying in. We love, we want to buy into a new program. We want, we want to be moved. Okay. Uh, you just heard your pastor beg for two minutes for life group leaders. The church growth depends on our people, but you've heard me in there's somebody saying, well, I just want to be moved, so I buy into this vision. We buy into these programs. We buy into worship. We buy into the, to the mission statement. We buy in, we buy in, we buy in. But I want to tell you something, friend. Being a Christian does not require you buying in. It requires you selling out. Those are two totally different things. I can buy in, but when I can buy in... At any time, I can cash out. How many college football fans, basketball fans, baseball fans, you saw the players quit on the coach halfway through the season? They had bought in, but they cashed out. See, that's what we want to be as Christians. We want to buy in, but at any time we don't get it our way, any time we're not completely crazy with every little detail, I'll just take my money and I'll go find somebody else spiritual money not money money we're not tbn i shouldn't have said that but i did <laughs> and i will cash in and buy in somewhere else but jesus said i don't require you to buy into me i require you to sell out because i don't want 80 percent of you i don't want 90 percent of you it's either a hundred percent or all matter of fact jesus said like this he said you you need to hate your mama you need to hate your daddy if you want to follow me, you got to hate your life because i got to be number one. It can't be that you're buying any. If you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself daily, pick up your cross, and follow me. He is looking for somebody that will sell out to him instead of buying in. And that's the reason why God can't move in these last days. We've got too many preachers, too many congregations, too many churches that are happy buying in. But what are you going to do one day when God tells you some news you don't want to hear? Have you sold out enough to say, God, I'm going to follow you? I'm going to follow you to the ends of the earth. I'm going to follow you when it's good. I, I, you know, Peter, had we, we, we get on such a hard time that he denied Christ. But on his deathbed, they said, we're going to crucify you. He had bought in before. This time he sold out. He said, well, you better crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to die the same way as my God has died. I'm just here to tell you, we want to be a church that buys in, but Christ is not looking for a church that dabbles on the side with the world. He's looking for somebody who has sold out to his cause. <laughs> it's 
Think about this. We have got to make a statement in our faith. Drastic action. Dramatic action is evidence of a drastic decision. That's what we've got to do. There's a story that gets so overlooked. You want to hear about it? It's really awesome. It's quick. You'll love it. Think about this. Anybody remember the story of the revival of Ephesus? It gets so overlooked, but it's so powerful. There was a revival that took place at Ephesus. That's where we get the book of? Y'all are so smart. At least this section is. I don't know what's going on here. Y'all didn't say anything. Uh, Y'all need, uh, y'all just teasing. I'm going to get a lot of letters tomorrow, ain't I? Come on. But there was a revival breakout at Ephesus. And you know what they did? They had a bunch of scrolls that were demonic, spiritual, evil, force scrolls. And the Bible says they got together because God did something in their life. And they said, let's burn them. Now, that don't seem like a big deal to you. But the Bible says they were worth 50,000 drachmas. I was like, I don't know what a drachma is. That sounds expensive. It was equivalent to 138 days wages. But not only that, I did the modern value, did a study. You know what kind of decision that was? Are you ready for this? It was a $3.7 million declaration of faith. Now, the modern day church was said, God has saved us. Let's just sell it, take the money, and we'll build a church. But they were more concerned about that evil living in their city. So instead, they didn't buy in. They sold out. They said 3.7 million. Anybody got any lighter fluid? Because we're not living with this evil in our city. Do you know what took place? Because they made that decision, a revival broke out. Because, honey, people aren't looking for your words. They're watching your actions. And today's church, you can wander all across. There'll be a church that they say the right thing, they say things differently, but when you get them in the world, they act just like the world. But God is saying, I don't want my church to buy in. I want my church to sell out. And if you will sell your people, will notice how you live differently. When my brother got saved... We still fought, but he was different. He got in one day, you know what he did? Made me mad. He got all some stuff that was personal, that was evil. I ain't going to get into it. It wasn't good. And I said, hey, where's my substances? And hey, where's my tapes? And hey, where's this? He said, oh, I burned them. (laughs) But right then and there, a seed was planted in my life. That said, there's something in that boy that he's willing to punch in the mouth, but he ain't having evil and illegal things in his house anymore. I'm telling you, church, you want to complain about your children, but the actions you're taking is telling them this is the way you ought to be. They don't want your words. They want your actions. Dragging them into church 40 minutes late, telling them, hey, I'm telling you, church, you want to know why your children are going to go up thinking church is a joke? Because we treat it differently than we do school, than we do ball, than we do work. Oh, I notice not many of us go late for vacation. And then we want to look and say, I don't know where I went wrong, brother, Dad, because listen, they don't want words. Gavin the other day says, Daddy, why do we got to go? I don't want to go to church. Because I said, son, church is the most important thing that we do. We can let the coach down, but we're not going to let the church down. We, we, we can be late for school and you go to detention before you'll be. Church is the most important thing that we do. Now, I'm just telling you, I'm leaving you on this. Is there anybody here just made up that you're ready to sell out? You're, you're ready to do something new in me because if you will give him a blank canvas, he'll paint a picture you never thought possible. You just got to sell out. Okay, the third and final point. People prefer rowboats. Carrie and I have been married 19 years. Somebody pray for Miss Carrie. Come on, somebody. (laughs) 19 years, I can't get my towel in the dirty clothes. 19 years of aggravation. 19 years of getting scared. 19 years. What a precious saint of God. And the church said... That was very hurtful, church. I expected y'all to revolt on that one. I just like, 
But we've been married. We went on a honeymoon. We went on a cruise. Remember the first day? You're all excited about the cruise. You're pumped. And the first thing they do is they get you up on the deck for the safety meeting. <laughs> what? Just what, what kind of rain on your parade is that? But I remember doing something when I was on that deck. I was looking around for the rowboats. And I was happy that they covered it because you know why? I had just saw the movie Titanic. <laughs> and I made up my mind, she ain't getting in that boat, and I'm not going down with the cello player. It just ain't going to happen. <laughs> Celine Dion, near, far, wherever you are. I'll tell you where I'm sinking to the bottom because you don't share that giant headboard up there. <laughs> Need the extra elbow room, I guess. I'll just go. How can I just have it for 15 minutes? Can we share? Nope. Wherever you are. Give me a break. Anyhow, we're looking for rowboats. You know what a rowboat is? It's a plan B. Plan A's having fun. It's celebrating, eating, gaining about 15 pounds. But the rowboat's there in case it don't go right. You know what the Lord would have me say to you? Too many plan A's are spoiled because you got a plan B. Plan B's are there. And this is what, nine out of ten times, failure is resorting to plan B when plan A gets too hard, too painful, or too risky. This stuff we live on nowadays, well, God said it was okay to get a divorce. Honey, God ain't never said that. God ain't going to say that. That would make God a liar. That would make him a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. God says, no. What you've convinced yourself is it gets so hard it's easier to go to plan B. How many believers start looking for rowboats right when you get on the thing because you know there's going to come a time where plan A gets hard. Life ain't going to be anybody in this building ever experienced Christianity where it got so hard you didn't know you were going to make it another day. I wish I could tell you, buddy, man, leprechauns are going to pop out everywhere and just leave you pots of gold and everything's going to be great. Sometimes Christianity gets hard but we can never attain plan a because when weeping comes in the night instead of holding on for in the morning we're going where's that rowboat when the enemy comes in us in one direction instead of standing and watching them flee seven different we start going there's a rowboat I, I, I want to drop this on you. It's a free one, and then I'm going to be quiet, and we're going to go home. God has a will for everything, and the church says, Amen. yet why come at 90% of the time when people leave a church, it's not because God's will said, I'm willing this. It's just because plan A got hard. Somebody stole your song. Somebody sat in your seat. The pastor said you couldn't do that ministry. They said no. They didn't like it. Well, we got cold in here. Y'all were the ones here. Why y'all so upset? And it's a good time to drop that so nobody can say Pastor Donnie's preaching at them. We ain't had nobody leave. Praise God, we hope nobody does. But hear me when I tell you, you will never attain plan A when you got a plan B available. So sometimes you just need to burn them rowboats. I, I look at some of the people here and I don't want to get into the names, but you've been dealing with cancer over this past year. I want you to look at somebody. I want you to realize the battle that they're going through with their body. And we got people in this church like Brother Ed that's lost their spouse. I mean, this, this year. Sometimes plan A is hard. But don't ever give in to plan B just because plan A is hard. Because let me let you in on a little secret. Plan A is going to work. It might rain somebody correct me if i'm wrong jesus was in a boat did it not rain did it not storm? did they not take on water was it not so scary that even his best friend said i don't think we should pray to jesus anymore he don't seem to be listening can we just go right above his head and go to god but did that boat go down there are going to be storms but storm ain't, storms are not going to keep me off plan a the winds might row, but I'm not getting off plan A. Somebody needs to sink your rowboats because you're going to jump ship at the wrong time. That might be too deep and that might be too harsh, but honey, that feels good to my spirit. Does that feel good to anybody else? You need to hear me. 
You don't need a plan B. You don't need a plan B. 